searching for interactions of ultralight axion like dark matter um, using NV centers and is it just NV centers? Actually, no NV centers. Oh, really? <laughs> I take it all back. Uh, I don't know, so I'm looking forward to your dog. <laughs> Thank you. So um, uh, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak, and uh, huge thanks to John for last night's uh, hospitality. Uh, the party was great. Thank you, John. Um, so, uh, okay. So I'm going to start, uh, you know, there's this dark matter, um, is a, this elephant in the room. Uh, we know that, the, uh, the, that it's there. There's many pieces of evidence. Uh, for this, and, and in fact, there's been a few talks already um, yesterday about uh, dark matter and, and you know where it comes from. Uh, so, uh, uh, some of the candidates for dark matter, by no means uh, are all, but I'm going to I'm going to talk about a couple. Uh, uh, now this, oh yeah, here we go. Okay, no, yeah, it, that works. That works. Yes. So uh, the, the WIMPs are, of course, uh, one candidate uh, that, that people have been searching for for a long, long time. Uh, and um, I will not talk about these, uh, uh, but uh, you know, the, these are basically kind of, one can think about them as, as, as little, uh, really heavy atoms or, or really particles of mass about 100 GeV uh, uh, that, are, that are floating around and that are interacting with us very feebly. Uh, but there is a, the, uh, well, in collaboration with Ron Walsworth, we actually do have um, some experimental effort trying to um, uh, detect or trying to search for, for these WIMPs, build a directional detector. Um, so this is, uh, and this is using NV Center, uh, in NV Centers and Diamond, but that's all I'll say about NV Centers and Diamonds. And actually, for the rest of my talk, I will focus on ultralight dark matter candidates, uh, such as Axion's dark photons, and these things are much, much lighter. Uh, it's a lot better to think about them not as particles, but as waves, as Conrad uh, uh, talked about yesterday. So this will be the focus of my talk. So uh, here's my one slide introduction to axions and axions like, axion like particles. Uh, they are uh, pseudoscalar, they have spin zero, and they have a broad range of possible masses. Uh, they've been proposed in the 1970s to solve the strong CP problem of quantum chromodynamics. And uh, my theory friends tell me that basically one cannot write down a string theory or, um, you know, a, 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 or, or some theory of uh, really high energies, uh, uh, of physics at high energies without uh, just a bunch of axions and axion-like particles just very naturally appearing in these theories. Um, so theories, theorists like them, uh, and they're a good candidate for axion dark matter, as was realized uh, in the 80s, sh uh, uh, shortly after they were proposed, uh, and in fact, if axions do uh, uh, make up uh, the primary component of dark matter, uh, then given the dark matter energy density, which we know, uh, and maybe we will uh, find out kind of the local dark matter energy density very shortly as soon as, soon as Dave gets around to analyzing that data, um, uh, uh, because the axions are so light, uh, then uh, one basically can divide the numbers, and uh, there's, there's a there's a large number of particles per de Broglie wavelength. So one can just simply describe this axion dark matter as a classical field. Uh, so uh, something that varies in time, uh, uh, like some amplitude times cosine omega t, where omega is uh, de Broglie, uh, the Compton frequency of the axion, mc squared over h bar. Uh, so here, here is my um, uh, picture that, that is trying to, uh, uh, trying to uh, um, visualize this classical field. Uh, the great thing about axions is there's actually very few uh, couplings that they have, very few uh, interactions uh, that they can have with standard model particles. One is uh, the interaction with the electromagnetic field. Uh, here, A is this axion field uh, um, uh, varying in time, and FA is a symmetry breaking scale, some large energy scale. There's an, axion, there's an interaction with gluon field. This is the, the actual interaction that uh, solves the strong CP problem of, of QCD. And there's the, there's the third interaction, this, this, um, uh, this is so-called wind. Uh, so, um, kind of, there's a lot of experimental effort uh, trying to search uh, for axion dark matter. Uh, and here is a, a, a figure that um, 
that tries to describe some of the uh, technologies that are used for uh, these kind of searches. Um, so, uh, uh, and again, this is, this is a very imperfect figure. This tries to cram a lot of information into, uh, into one plot. Uh, but basically, uh, there's a bunch of bounds up at, so, so one plots the axion mass on the x-axis. Nobody knows what that is. And the coupling strength on the y-axis. Um, really, a, a target uh, is the QCD axion, which, which lies on this red line. But in principle, uh, axion-like particles can be anywhere within this space over here. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Conrad talked about uh, microwave cavities yesterday. There's lump circuit experiments, there's magnetic resonance experiments, which is what I'll talk about uh, today. Uh, and even at, at low frequencies, one, uh, uh, one can use atom interferometers, torsion pendula, and so on. So uh, this is kind of, uh, 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 this is a plot that, uh, the, the red line is, is always the target, but in principle, this, this is possible to, uh, uh, to search for axion-like particles up in this bluish space here. Uh, and the, the other great thing about axions, this is relevant for this workshop, is that um, most of these efforts here are really laboratory scale experiments. So they're run by small teams of people uh, in, um, uh, in a lab, in, uh, in kind of really a tabletop experiments. So here is um, a picture of our experiment. There was a workshop just a couple of, um, just about a month ago here where we had the, the Stanford DM radio collaboration come over uh, and hang out with us for a, for a few days. Uh, discussing these experiments. So here is a, an actual close-up of one of our experiments. It's really kind of this size. Um, okay, so uh, I've already talked about these couplings. Uh, uh, let me focus uh, on, on the actual details and let me talk about um, uh, 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 some of these in a little more detail. So the coupling to photons, there's a, really the majority of the experiments to date have focused on this coupling uh, of, of axions uh, to electromagnetic fields. And I'll talk very briefly about a search in my laboratory uh, using toroidal magnetic cores, uh, trying to search for this coupling over here. Uh, the coupling to gluons creates oscillating nucleon electric dipole moments, and this is why axions were invented. And this coupling to fermions creates the axion wind. Um, and uh, in terms of non-relativistic Lagrangians, uh, writing this down, this looks like basically a spin dot effective electric field interaction. So this is this uh, EDM type interaction. Uh, and the wind is a spin dot gradient of the axion field. So that's the wind. Um, and Casper Electric is the experiment searching for this interaction. Casper Wind is, the, is searching for this interaction over here. And together, uh, they are the Casper experimental program. Um, Okay, so let me first focus on the coupling to photons. So here, uh, really, ADMX is uh, uh, the leader in the field. Uh, they uh, have recently reached down to this uh, QCD coupling, uh, um, the, this QCD axion target, uh, the, in fact, the DFSZ uh, model over here in this uh, frequency range between about 640 and about 680 megahertz, uh, and, and now scanning, um, uh, uh, scanning beyond that. Uh, so this is described in this paper over here. Uh, and, of course, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's several other cavity experiments. Haystack is over here somewhere. Uh, so these kind of microwave cavities, they're really good if you want to search for axions around a gigahertz or 10 gigahertz uh, or thereabouts. That's really the technology to use. Uh, what we wanted to do is extend these techniques to lower frequencies. So... Uh, rather than search around a gigahertz, we wanted to go down to megahertz, maybe hundreds of kilohertz or so. Uh, and here, this is, uh, uh, th th this is the idea. Let me talk about this. So if one writes down uh, Maxwell's equations uh, uh, in presence of this interaction over here, uh, then uh, the Ampere's law gets another little term over here. So this is the term um, uh, that's proportional to the axion-photon coupling. This is G. A gamma gamma, uh, and of course involves the axion field uh, and the magnetic field. So what this looks like, if you have a tor if you have a magnetic field that's that that, uh, let's say I, I wound um, a toroidal coil that creates a magnetic field, uh, uh, a toroidal magnetic field like this, as a mutual uh, static magnetic field, uh, then um, and in presence of the oscillating axion field, you can just plug into this equation over here. 
uh, this, um, this then creates uh, something that looks like a current uh, that's parallel to, uh, that runs around in a circle like this. It's just, it's just basically, uh, uh, you, know, you, 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 you this, I'm saying this term over here looks like a current in an Ampere's law that creates a uh, um, magnetic field. If there's a current that uh, runs in a circle like this, then it creates an axial magnetic field. And this is um, uh, uh, then detected by a squid sensor uh, 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 oriented with the, with the pickup coil oriented um, like to, in this, uh, so it can detect this azimuthal field. Uh, and the idea that, that uh, of our experiment is uh, we noticed that, of course, well, we weren't the first, of course, uh, uh, that the, the magnitude of this current is directly proportional to the field B0. Um, uh, uh, so the bigger the field, uh, the bigger the current, the bigger the effect. Uh, so the idea was to use magnetic core materials to enhance this magnetic field B0 within the toroid. Uh, so we, uh, we actually just, just uh, uh, bought commercial ferromagnetic cores, wound uh, a coil around them that looks like this, uh, and it turns out that one, it's possible to get uh, an enhancement of about a factor of 50 uh, uh, of this magnetic field B0. So if I just run a current uh, through an air core toroid, I will get um, just the magnetic, uh, kind of a straight line over here, the magnetic field versus current. Um, we started off actually with some uh, gadolinium iron garnet ferrite powders. That's the, the, the blue points over here. But then we found a better material, an iron nickel alloy, uh, that can give us uh, really almost for free with just a couple of amps of current running through this coil, we can get up to about one and a half Tesla or thereabouts. Yes? Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, just to, you know, uh, um, at some point I will hit the saturation and magnetization yes. of whatever I put in there. Yes. Uh, and at that point I don't uh, win anymore. Correct. Uh, so basically this is, if you like, a way to get much bigger fields with uh, much lower currents. Yes, and that's right. Like, uh, sort of less complexity associated that's with That's right. Um, is it true to say that, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, biggest magnetic fields you get are still, you know, made by putting gigantic currents in uh, things with vacuum cores? Absolutely true, okay. yes. This is a free ride. This gets you a free ride to about one and a half, maybe two Tesla. But, of course, this can't go beyond that because uh, that's, a, I think, the, the best materials, the highest saturation field is about two Tesla okay. that I've found. Does that answer your question? Uh, it does, and also, you know, thank you for not shaming. Oh, it's no shame. I, I, I don't understand magnetism either, certainly. Uh, um, no, absolutely not. No chance. Uh, okay, so uh, in order to pick up the signal over here, we use uh, just a squid superconducting quantum interference device. Uh, we use a commercial magnicon squids. Uh, and when we put them into our experiment, we see that uh, this sum, uh, so this is a noise spectrum versus, um, uh, uh, of the squid signal versus frequency uh, inside um, uh, this experiment. And uh, at low frequency we, uh, frequencies, we see some vibration peaks, but between about a kilohertz and about a megahertz, so thereabouts, uh, the noise level of the squids are nice and quiet, which is what we want. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's at performance. Uh, th that's a design level. And... And then what we do is we don't have one of these toroids. We actually uh, put together, um, well, either two or three, depending on, 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 uh, uh, on the, the kind of the, uh, the incarnation of the experiment. Here, uh, just to confuse things, I'm showing three over here in the picture and two uh, over here on the right-hand side. Uh, so what we do, uh, John talked um, in, in a lot of detail about reversals and, and, uh, yesterday. Uh, we're trying to basically incorporate a reversal. So if we see, um, if we see this axion signal, uh, then if the magnetizations in the, our two channels are opposite to each other, then the axion signal should be out of phase. Uh, and we, we check that. We, uh, so, so this is a way to kind of reverse magnetization by basically running two copies of the experiment. So rather than have one toroid and then reverse its magnetization, uh, and then check it that way, we just have two toroids with opposite magnetization. 
And actually, the metal one here uh, has no magnetization whatsoever. So if we see some kind of an axion signal and it's a peak uh, um, and it's present, for example, in all three toroids, then it's, it's probably someone's cell phone or some kind of a RF interference. Whereas uh, if it has the right phase behavior in the sense that these are out of phase and there's no peak in the middle, uh, then, then that's, a, that's a candidate for an axion signal. So uh, we, uh, a few months ago, we ran this for about 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, after about 30 minutes of averaging, we see um, uh, uh, here is a plot of the, um, of the coupling, coupling strength that we, um, uh, 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 versus, versus axion mass or, or frequency uh, that we are sensitive to. And we're just a factor of three or so uh, above uh, the limit set by the CAST experiment. Uh, so uh, what we've done actually just yesterday, our um, uh, four-day experimental run, uh, finished uh, running, so uh, we now have about 150 or 200 times more data, so we're analyzing this right now, so hopefully we'll be uh, in this region over here. Um, so CAST is, of course, the CERN Axion Solar Telescope, uh, uh, which, which uh, searches for solar axions, uh, and um, uh, uh, to, just to kind of put this, uh, uh, this exclusion on, on a plot uh, that contains a lot of other experiments, that would be uh, right over here somewhere. So this is really at the low frequency uh, end of the axion couplings. Uh, and of course, um, you know, I want to point out that DM radio is really the experiment uh, that is, uh, 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 that's running at Stanford uh, in Kent Irwin's group. Uh, and those guys, what they want to do is basically from about a kilohertz to about, I think, 300 megahertz or thereabouts, they want to build a resonant experiment. It's going to be a lot more sensitive uh, uh, than anything uh, we can do, uh, but they, they're going to have to scan, and they want to reach, reach down to the QCD axion, uh, certainly between about a, meg, a few megahertz, I think, and about 300 megahertz. So, but what we've built is a broadband test bed uh, experiment that is actually uh, uh, pretty sensitive to axion coupling. Okay, yes, Sorry, Shimon. Yeah, so there's, well, there's constraints and uh, hints, uh, right? So there's a supernova constraint over here. Uh, there's some hints um, uh, uh, shown over here. So yes, there is some astrophysical data as well, um, uh, uh, absolutely. But there's also hints. There's a, there's a wide dwarf cooling hint uh, that, that we're hoping to reach uh, over here. So we'll see what happens. Yes. Uh, yes, actually, Abracadabra is in a very similar mass range. They're not using uh, ferromagnetic cores, so they actually uh, had to go and build uh, or order uh, superconducting, toroidal superconducting magnets, so they're trying to run hundreds of amps. Uh, Where do they sit on this uh, so very, well, I think they're a little bit above this, um, uh, and we're hoping to be way below the cast. So they haven't reached the cast limit yet. Georgia? Uh, the, the limits, yes. Yeah. So, of course, to uh, right. So, so these projections over here is with a meter cubed uh, 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 magnet. So, so it roughly sc scales as the volume. Okay. So, oh, I see. So that assumes a bigger magnet. Uh, this over here does. Yes. This is with. Uh, oh, I don't have a scale bar uh, here, but but this is basically our toroids are roughly like this. Okay. But it scales with the volume. Yes. Scales as the volume. John. Uh, yeah, very carefully. It's actually, um, I, I think, um, uh, I, I don't know is the short answer to your question, and I know that there's a lot of design that goes into that. Um, so it's not trivial. I'm not sure if there's too many big superconducting toroidal magnets around in the world at all, actually. Either. Either, yeah. That's huge. Right. Uh, but I'm not sure that they, they get to this to this, to the, to, I don't know what the field is in the, in ITER, the magnetic field. I don't know. Um, any other questions before I proceed to Casper? Okay, so uh, on this on this picture of on this slide over here, I just talked about searching for coupling to photons, uh, and for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on Casper, which is uh, searching for these two couplings: coupling to gluons and to coup the coupling to fermions. Um, 
so uh, the CASPIC collaboration, uh, we have a, uh, we're in a bunch of institutions. Uh, uh, so here uh, on the top left are the people who are doing the work, uh, and on the top right are the people who are doing the talking. Uh, so uh, you know, we're, we're collaborating with Dima Budko's group at Mainz. Uh, there's Peter, Sujit, and Derek uh, down here. And uh, we're basically uh, mostly, um, th there's now a lot more experiments than this, but it's good to think about Casper as Casper Electric, uh, which is running in my group here at Boston University, look, uh, using uh, spins and solids, and Casper Wind, which uses liquid xenon, um, which is running in mines. Um, so um, I'm going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to do a kind of a one slide introduction to uh, magnetic resonance, even though I'm sure everybody in the audience um, probably definitely uh, knows about NMR, and some of you probably know a lot more about NMR than I do. Um, so, uh, 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 but I wanted to do this nonetheless because Casper is very similar to NMR. So, in NMR, the, uh, so there's no axions on this slide. It's just we just have a spin interacting with a magnetic field, sigma dot b. That's the Hamiltonian. Uh, and then we, uh, we have a spin or a, an ensemble of spins, and we apply a constant bias magnetic field B0 and a radio frequency field uh, B1. Uh, and under this bias field, the spins levels split, spin up and spin down. Um, and um, the spins like to be here in the, in the ground state. Uh, uh, so there's some kind of thermal uh, or hyperpolarization. And if you look at a sample, this corresponds to some kind of magnetization. Uh, and then if... Uh, this radio frequency resonance field, uh, if this radio frequency field is on resonance with the spin flip transition, uh, then it can uh, flip spins or create coherences between these uh, states. Uh, and what that looks like is the magnetization tilting, and then in the bias magnetic field, the magnetization processes, and then there's a, some kind of a sensor that's coupled to the sample, such as a squid or, or just a, 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 a coil, uh, and uh, that detects this. Um, processing magnetization over here. So that's an NMR experiment. Um, now back to axions. Uh, if we look at these two interactions, Casper Electric and Casper Wind, and we actually plug in uh, this axion uh, or, or axion-like field as A0 cosine omega t, and we go and we plug that in, we can write the two Hamiltonians like this. And the reason I'm doing this uh, is, as you can probably tell, is so I can write it as some kind of spin times some kind of B1 star cosine omega t. Now, B1 star is not a real magnetic field. It's not a magnetic field that obeys Maxwell's equations, for example. Uh, it's just simply there. It's an effective magnetic field that's there to describe uh, um, uh, or to kind of uh, to, to write down the Hamiltonian uh, and the energy shifts that the spin uh, experiences because of these interactions. So, uh, having written this down, I'm going to go back and go through my slide on magnetic resonance one more time. Here is my interaction, sigma dot b1 star cosine omega t. Uh, so, I still apply a real bias magnetic field b0, and now uh, I have this interaction in the Hamiltonian as well. So, once again, in this bias magnetic field, my spin state split, and I develop some kind of polarization that corresponds to this magnetization. And now, if I get lucky, and my spin levels are split by exactly the amount that corresponds uh, 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 to this frequency over here, so that the, this uh, omega is on resonance with the spin splitting, uh, then uh, I can get spin flips and coherences between these uh, uh, spin states, which basically means that the magnetization can tilt, once again process around the bias field, and I coupled a detector to my sample um, that detects this processing magnetization. Of course, I put a superconducting magnetic shield around the experiment as well to make sure that I'm screening out uh, uh, all the RF fields that are coming in from the outside. Uh, so basically, CASPER is an NMR experiment where we don't apply RF pulses to tilt the spins. It's the axions that are doing this for us. Uh, and the way we, of course, don't know what this omega A is, so what we have to do is we have to scan this bias magnetic field B0 uh, and search for the magic value when we detect something with our um, detector. So this now becomes kind of like a, a, a detector for axion light dark matter. Okay, so now uh, let me go, uh, I have about maybe five, ten minutes. 
Okay, good. So I'm going to uh, uh, describe in a little bit of detail the actual zoo of experiments that we've been uh, um, uh, 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 we've been working on in the Casper collaboration. So let me start with the Casper wind experiment uh, or experiments that are uh, led by Dima Butker's group at Mainz uh, and Berkeley. Um, uh, so there's, there's, for example, uh, a re an experiment that came out with a recent result that you may have heard about yesterday from Eric's talk is Casper um, Zulf, which is an axion wind search using uh, what Dima already had in his lab, so nothing that was built. Uh, it's actually using not xenon, but carbon-13 enriched formic acid uh, that's sitting over here inside uh, uh, some magnetic shielding, and, and this is using atomic magnetometers to, to pick up the signal. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this experiment um, uh, kind of achieved uh, the sensitivities, uh, uh, the sensitivity shown over here. Uh, and actually, there's another experiment, Casper Zulf co-magnetometer, which is probing uh, uh, the frequencies down here that are very, very low. So mass is about 10 to the minus 20 electron volts. Um, so uh, uh, these, these papers over here uh, describe these results. Uh, and what Eric was talking about yesterday, of course, is um, this kind of really low frequency dependence. Uh, how does this... Excellent. Yep. So, so, uh, so Eric and I are in ongoing discussions uh, about exactly how this should turn back up and what this frequency dependence should be. So, stand by for updates, uh, potential updates to this plot. Excellent. So, uh, you guys can can also play, place bets. There's, there's bottles of whiskey at stake here. Um, uh, anyway, so so these are these two experiments here. And I should, I should also mention, of course, Eric's paper um, recently. I'm not sure where you guys are uh, on this plot over here. Um, down, down here, somewhere? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So I should really... The results. Okay. The best, the best of the NEDM results. Good. We're flat below that. Excellent. So uh, Eric's, uh, Eric's uh, torsion pendulum uh, uh, constraints are over here, so we should really update this, uh, uh, this plot. Uh, and include those. And also update your results. Yes, and also update our results as well with the correct uh, scaling. So, um, uh, so, so that's that's kind of uh, those are the experiments. Yes. Sorry, can you go back? One yes. Uh, what was this coupling again? This is the. Yes. 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 The wind, this is this gradient A coupling. This is this axion wind. So if an axion field has a gradient, that's the wind, uh, then the effective magnetic field is proportional to gradient of, of A, of the axion field. Okay. So then it depends on where I am and, uh, I mean, where Earth is. So uh, which direction? Well, yes. This is actually, um, you know, the Earth rotation, for example, yeah. these low, really low frequencies the Earth rotation up converts these signals to 24-hour period. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so Casper wind high frequency uh, is actually uh, being built right now, and this is uh, trying to go to higher frequencies. So once again, up to hundreds of megahertz and thereabouts. So this is using liquid xenon, hyperpolarized liquid xenon. So there's a bunch of um, uh, pictures of hardware uh, the xenon polarizer is currently working, and um, that's in progress. Hopefully, have some first results early next year. Uh, okay, now at Boston, in my group, uh, we are running a, a Casper electric experiment, which is now not sensitive to, or well, it is sensitive to the wind coupling, uh, but what we are trying to do is we're trying to search for this electric coupling, the oscillating EDM uh, of nucleons. And so, the, so this is the, uh, uh, what the experiment looks like. Um, so let me very quickly uh, run through the details there. So the sample that we use is uh, just a ferroelectrically polarized PMNPT. So it's, it's basically a ferroelectric crystal uh, with this chemical formula over here. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, it's a, about five millimeter diameter cylinder as shown over there. And the reason we, we use the, uh, the solid is um, so that we can actually um, take advantage of this big effective electric field 
3 times 10 to the 8 volts per centimeter. The physics here is very similar to what John talked about yesterday um, uh, uh, in, in, in the ACME experiment in the polar molecules. One can think very, very roughly about this as a bunch of polar molecules that are stacked together in a solid and all polarized in the same direction. Um, so it's just a ferroelectric crystal. And uh, we confirm that indeed, uh, you know, we do, uh, uh, well, what, what we do is we take this crystal and we apply an electric field to it. You can see a real electric field of just a few kilovolts per centimeter, something we can do in the lab. Uh, and then what we see is this ferroelectric uh, hysteresis loop. And what we can do is if we stop over here, then we indeed have polarized our sample and then we have this effective electric field. Or we can ramp up and then uh, ramp around this loop and we can stop over here so the polarization is zero. Um, and then that, the depolarized solid should show no axion signal. So once again, there's going to be the same trick over here where we used several samples, so if we, uh, some of which are sensitive to axions and some of which are not. Um, the, the sensor, we're using, uh, uh, depending on frequency, we use either a squid at frequencies below a megahertz or a um, cryogenic RF amplifier at higher frequencies. And then we put everything inside uh, the superconducting magnet over here, which goes inside this liquid helium dewar um, uh, right here. So uh, the first thing we did is we just calibrated our experiment, meaning we actually applied RF pulses. So we've got to make sure that the experiment works. So we did NMR on our sample. Uh, and so we tuned our magnetic field so that the NMR frequency is 46 and a half megahertz. Uh, and we actually tilted the spins and we observed the precession of the magnetization. Uh, this is the Fourier transform over here. So this is just uh, the NMR line. Um, we actually use small tip angle pulses. We didn't do the full pi and two pulse because we don't need to. We have a sensitive enough amplifier that we can just detect this with, with kind of pi over 100 pulses is, is fine. Uh, and importantly, we actually measured uh, the, the, uh, the T1 time um, uh, of our spins, meaning after we polarize, we, so we established some thermal polarization, how long does, does this polarization live for if we, say, take away the magnetic field or scan it down to search for axions? It turns out that the T1 time uh, is about 23 minutes, so they're about, um, uh, so that's, that's certainly sufficiently long. The, the experimental strategy is to pre-polarize at higher fields and then we'll have 20 minutes to scan the, 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 the magnetic field around, search for axions, uh, and then um, kind of once, once this polarization is spent, then we go back up, repolarize, and so on. Um, so uh, then what we, uh, that's, uh, so, so uh, after we, uh, uh, we did this NMR calibration, we then go and we just sit there. We don't apply any pulses. So we just kind of quietly sit there and watch, and then an axion, um, well, for some reason here it's at 10 kilohertz, but, you know, here we're sensitive to f about 46 and a half megahertz. Then an axion would, would show up as a peak uh, um, in, in, the, uh, in the data over here. And then we can uh, run this through our data analysis uh, and, and bin the data and basically uh, have a look at our noise. It's nice and Gaussian. And then we can use this to place some preliminary uh, limits on the axion uh, gluon coupling shown over here. Um, so uh, our, our first limits are approaching the supernova astrophysical bounds. Uh, once again, this is about 30 minutes of data taking over about a megahertz bandwidth. Uh, and what we're doing right now is scanning back and forth. So this is now a resonant experiment, so we have to scan. Uh, so this is just at, at one frequency, and then we're scanning everything back and forth. Uh, so uh, in the last couple of minutes, um, here is, uh, as I said, here is the, uh, uh, the typical plot where, uh, where people show their sensitivity. So the axion mass is on the x-axis. This axion gluon coupling is on the y-axis. This is the supernova bounds. Uh, so our five millimeter experiment, uh, what we projected our sensitivity to be is uh, this curve over here. And indeed, the first results up here at about 46 megahertz, uh, they have exactly that sensitivity. So right now, what we're doing is we scanning uh, uh, from about a megahertz up to about 100 megahertz using our RF, RF amplifier. And then below that, we're going to use the squids that I talked about in the first part of my talk uh, uh, to take out this chunk over here. And then to get down to the QCD axion uh, using this technique, all one has to do is scale up the sample. Uh, basically go from 5 millimeters to about 30 millimeters, uh, uh, 30 centimeters, I'm sorry. 
uh, and um, maybe get a slightly bigger magnet, maybe cool down uh, to 300 millikelvin, um, and then one can uh, get down here. We're also collaborating with Ken Turwin's group at uh, Slack to use a magnetic sensor that is better than a squid uh, uh, to, pick up, um, uh, to pick up our signal. And so the sensitivity reaches uh, this level over here. Uh, and the ultimate, uh, so I should, I should mention that the sensitivity is really limited by the sensor. If we, someone gave us a better sensor, we would have a better sensitivity. But the ultimate limit is, of course, given by the spin projection noise of our sample. We have, um, we have a lot of spins in our sample, so there's a, there's a square root of n spin projection noise. And in fact, that's been detected uh, uh, in John Clark's group uh, back in the 1980s using squids. Uh, so this is this red line over here. So this is the ultimate limit of our exper to our experiment. And we're trying to, um, what we're doing is we have an ongoing effort to actually push even beyond uh, um, uh, uh, this kind of simple uh, sensitivity here and try and reach this SQL. Uh, and what we're doing is we're, uh, we have a combination of hyperpolarize, uh, uh, we're trying to hyperpolarize our nuclear spins. We're using dynamical decoupling. Shimon talked about that yesterday. And we may be even thinking about doing some spin squeezing uh, in our sample using radio frequency resonant circuits, once again in collaboration with uh, Ken's group. Um, so let me spend just, just a couple more slides uh, on clarifying exactly what this means. It turns out that uh, if you shine laser at our material, then one can create paramagnetic centers. So the material is, is, has no electron spins. It's just an insulator. But if you shine a laser at it, uh, then you can ionize some of the lead atoms, uh, and they become lead 3 plus instead of lead 2 plus, and then you have electron spins sitting over here in the sample. And then uh, through hyperfine interaction, it's actually possible to polarize nuclear spins because electron spins have a, a thousand times more magnetic moment, so one can transfer the polarization from electron spins to nuclear spins. And using EPR, indeed, we, uh, sh we, we, sh we uh, shine a laser at our sample, uh, and we see these EPR signals um, at, you know, at 10 Kelvin uh, uh, that, that are due to these, um, to these uh, transient paramagnetic centers. They're transient because if you turn the laser on, here's the EPR signal that, that kind of increases on the time scale of a minute or so. You turn the laser off, the EPR signal dies on the time scale of 10, 20 minutes. So they're, they're long-lived transient centers. So then one can, in this time, one can then go and polarize nuclear spins. Uh, and in fact, what we do see is when we shine the laser on, the T1 time of our sample drops. This is very preliminary, just kind of from uh, uh, last week. Uh, so this is because these electron spins fluctuate, and they actually uh, uh, they relax the nuclear spins. Um, so that's, that's great. What this gives us hope for is... Uh, that we can um, that we can do this. We, we can uh, th these things really interact, and we can really transfer this polarization to nuclear spins. Okay, so uh, just last slide summary. Uh, what I talked about today is an experiment using ferromagnetic toroids that's searching for uh, the axion uh, axion-like dark matter uh, coupling to electromagnetic fields, and then I talked about the Casper experiments um, uh, that are searching for Casper wind. Uh, that are searching for axion wind and axion gluon couplings. Thank you very much for your attention. Could you say a few words about the super uh, detector you have uh, with Slack? Ooh, uh, well, we don't have it yet. Um, uh, yes, so can I say a few words about that? So um, it's basically, uh, the, uh, the Kent's, Kent calls it the a radio frequency quantum up converter, uh, and uh, the idea here is to um, couple uh, a radio frequency signal and up convert it to uh, the microwave domain, and then use, uh, for example, JPAs or, or some some really uh, um, uh, quantum limited amplifiers to try and detect that. So, so I, Ken talks about it as as kind of uh, um, a step up beyond what squids can do. Uh, how do you upconvert? So you you basically uh, uh, so there's this uh, Zappi uh, geometry. So with, with with three Josephson junctions. So you you you, you and, and then you drive that. Um, I don't know if this answers your question, um, but 
maybe I have a, uh, I don't know if I have a, an actual slide of what this will look like. Let me see. Let me see if I can, um, if I can bring this up. Yeah, so this is the actual uh, geometry over here. So you couple, you couple to this, this something called RQU, and then you drive this and you look at the reflection there. Uh, me neither. But um, do I understand that basically uh, I have some sort of like effective time varying inductance? Yes. And I get some parametric process. That's that. right. Yes. Um, and uh, here's another fair question, which I'll ask you because, you know, why not? Yeah. <laughs> By all means. Uh, is it, uh, so I can understand that I can do kind of parametric conversion of frequency. Do you know if it's kind of uh, conversion? I think it's pure conversion. So I think, and and the, the, I, what 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 they're hoping to do is 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 maybe even squeeze over here, but but uh, um, as far as I understand, there's no gain. Yes. So, but again, this is this is Kent's uh, uh, efforts. So, you know, on our end, we just want to couple these two spins. No, I understand. You know, it's just like someone's going to give you this awesome amplifier. And yeah. Everything's going to get better. That's right. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Can you talk a little bit about systematics in the in the uh, ferrite core technique? And I appreciate that when you're not driving them actively, a whole bunch of the normal Present, but it's, it still seems like solids seem terrifying to me. Yes. And and how do you know that the signal you're seeing is what you think it is? Mm -hmm. Can you say a few words about that? Yeah, please. Uh, of course, by all means. Uh, so the um, I don't really have uh, uh, what the signal look, uh, should look like, but basically. Uh, so the systematics, the only systematic that we can have is some kind of a radio frequency signal that couples in. So what, okay, so maybe, maybe I should back up here. The, the actual experimental strategy is the following. So we have these toroids, and what we do is we, uh, so we wound this toroidal magnet on them, and we run a current, a couple of amps through that, and then we just, we, we make it uh, persistent. So we just, uh, and then we disconnect all the wires. So we lock it in there, we, we uh, shut off the persistence switch, and you know that's locked in, it's a superconducting magnet, and it's circulating there. We can actually measure the inductance of the toroid and verify that indeed there is a current in there because the, the permeability of the toroid changed. Uh, it's saturated. Uh, so once we do that, we just disconnect everything, and we, we, we sit there and wait, and we look for coherent signals uh, in the toroid. So the only systematics can be some kind of an RF pick up interference that, that couples in. Uh, and then we use, the, the strategy is to use these kind of uh, three, two or three channels to try and reject that. Um, does that, uh, uh, so the only systematic that, that, that I can think of at least is, you know, just RF pickup, RF interference. We, we, and what is that extra noise? Yeah, good, good. That's that. We were scared of that, but it turns out that that. Uh, so, I think I showed uh, the actual. So here is this is the the squid signal with magnetized toroids. So there's no there's no extra noise, and and there's certainly no. Why isn't there this It it's actually there. So uh, I don't have references here. So when I was um, uh, when I was a postdoc, we studied. Uh, uh, these noise sources, they will, they will come up at low frequencies. So at low frequencies, there will be... No, we're going to look here between a kilohertz and a megahertz. Uh, this Barkhausen noise uh, and, you know, all, all of these ferromagnetic noise sources, they will pop up at lower frequencies than that. So, uh, so here we're uh, um, 
uh, we, we, we're stopping here at a kilohertz. And none of the later plots had anything below a kilohertz? Uh, so certainly not for this. For Caspar Zulf, yes. But that's a different game. Yes. Uh, yes, George? Continuing on the previous thing, so what, okay, what you call systematics is essentially background. You're saying that there's no background, or the only background you thought you described before. Yes. So what about sensitivity? How, how do you check that if there is a signal existing in the base? Ah, good. So we, we have uh, calibration coils uh, that we put in there that we just inject signals to uh, into, and we, we verify, for example, that these things are out of phase. Um, so it's, you know, we, we have, uh, I think, four or five calibration coils that we've wound around these toroids. We actually run real currents around the toroid, and we make sure that our squids are sensitive to real currents. Right. So those are, uh, so those are solenoids. Just a one loop. Just one loop. Yeah. It's enough to one loop. This is really sensitive, so just one loop. Yep. Yes, there's two layers of uh, lead superconducting shielding around. All right, so we are going to take a break for coffee, and please feel free to keep asking questions.